my name is Andrew Gilligan. Um, this is my first time actually speaking at one of these, and I'm super excited. Uh, so a little bit about me. I've been doing products for over 10 years, a lot of different startups. Uh, currently at Retail Me Not, which I love. They're fantastic. Uh, and then Smato, uh, ad tech, uh, OpenX ad tech, Lyft DNA ad tech. Ticket Leap uh, is like an event ticketing platform and some other ones that are not worth mentioning. But these were all super fun. And um, so through the years, uh, I have done a lot of picking, a lot of working of roadmaps. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about today. Um, and largely, in a less than ideal situation, how can you have amazing outcomes? Um, and I've been able to do this in really trying environments. And, and some of this is a little house of cards. But I, you know, a lot of you may be in these situations and may be like, dude, I just want to get my feature shit. And it's not even a feature. Like, if we just do this thing, this company will be profitable. If we just do this thing, we'll get acquired. If we just do this thing, we'll be differential and have a moat. Um, and people may not be listening to you. Or maybe the CEO is just like, no, my five things. These are the five things we're doing for the rest of the year. These are the five things we're doing the year after. And we're pretty much going to ignore anything that you come to the table with. Um, so these are some of the situations that you may have to do. And hands raised. Who has dealt with some of the situations where they're not really in charge of dealing with prioritization of the roadmap, the bit of the whims of an executive body uh, that you know has their executive offsite, comes back to you with a big decree that says, this is what we're investing in, and here are the funds, and here's what you're working on. Um, it's your job to break through that. It's your job to shift good outcomes. It's your job to make sure that the right things happen. Um, and if you can't take it head on, you can take it side. <coughs> so, um, Two of these companies got acquired, really fun, really crazy. Uh, small startups and big startups. Um, I studied art in college, so I am not an MBA, and I did not study engineering. Uh, so a lot of how I approach problems is around the user side of things, which has been advantageous to me. So roadmaps um, are flexible. They will not stay the same no matter how much you want them to. Uh, they're constant changing, like you're just not going to ship on time or you know, a sales team will come in and change priorities or your major competitor releases the major feature that you wanted to do and you need to iterate on it or the entire infrastructure that you wanted to like, ship it on is not up to the job and you need to do some foundation work. These are all things that happen. Um, when you're building a roadmap, these are all assumptions. Every time that people go off in an offsite and they're like, oh, we're going to work on this for the next 12 months, like you're making tons of assumptions that your business will be the same today uh, as it will be in 12 months from now. You're making tons of assumptions that, like, I want to do 25% uh, more MAUs in my, my application, that if I do this feature, that suddenly, like, more users will be using it. And you may be able to do that, but it might not be the real outcome that you wanted. Um, but there's tons of assumptions. The bias involved in this, depending on your team, if you have a single decider, CEO, it's like, this is what we do, there's inherent personal bias with that. But that's a little bit better than when you have a um, committee of like executives coming in from different opinions, and they've all got their horse in the game. They've all got their, like, you know, I make money off this, my success matrix off this, or my vision for what the company could be are off this. And being able to like balance and and uh, be able to trade across those is really super difficult. Um, roadmaps do not build organizational alignment, ever. Just because you have a roadmap, just because you jammed it down every salesperson's throat, just because you like had a all hands meeting, does not mean anyone's gonna believe it. So those things still need to happen on the side of the roadmap, if you're gonna have them. I mean, ideally, yeah, it'd be great if we didn't have to have documents like this, but a lot of places still do, and sometimes you just have to work with them. Um, they point people in a general direction. That's the best you can expect. Like, we're not going to finish this in the next six months. It is a big project. Be ready to catch it with the marketing team, the support team, and everyone else that needs to be ready for the go-to-market in six months from now, give it plus or minus like, some amount of time. Uh, they rarely take into account maintenance or feature debt. And that's like a massive problem. When you're in a tiny startup, it feels like you're moving so fast because there is no maintenance. Like, you're just blazing through. Everything on your roadmap is just like, we estimated this and we did this. Like, we're amazing. And then you get into a bigger company and then you've got all this tech debt and you've got all this maintenance and you've got operations that needs features. And then, um, you know, it's, it's really easy to have 70% of your capacity just like swallowed by those things. And they're not represented in there. 
These are all ambition. This is the business team, the business development team, the CEOs, the executives, the product team being like, we need these. We need these to be relevant. We need these to like, you know, maintain our space in, in this uh, ecosystem. So this presentation presumes that you as product managers want to do something about this. You've got a really fantastic big idea, a big vision. I mean, this is maybe not North Star. Maybe it's not, you know, doing artificial intelligence for an e-commerce company, but maybe this is something that's dramatic. And in order to do that, you really need to pause all this other arbitrary shit that was on the roadmap. Um, it's like, we committed to too much, these aren't the right things, it's not gonna show the right impact, and you know, if we can work on these things, we should have some real outcomes. This is also assuming that you're good at doing products. That you, you, you listen to the users, you, you measure the environment, you, um, you are thinking about differentiation, the competitive mode. You're thinking about how might I do this and solve this person's pain in a way that's like people would care about. And that, why should I care about it? That, that's a really important piece. So given that assumption, and given that people aren't just like investing in you as a person right now to say, you know what, stop everything else that we're planning on doing. We're going to take on your future and your vision for this company. Um, these are, next slide's going to be some of the goals. Um, but these are some of the things I've heard in different companies over the years. Like the users are begging for the feature. We're in the perfect place to do this thing. But it's different than what we're planning on. Uh, we're turning on individual features where we should be building growth. You know, that feature factory stuff. Uh, we have a North Star, but maybe we need a new one. A 10-year-old startup that had a North Star that was only went as far as that first five years, like you need to revisit that at some point. Like, there's a second growth arc that needs to happen, and it's totally plausible that you will end up in a company that needs that second growth arc. Um, future stuff. You know, VR right now. We're in a town with VR, Pokemon hit, uh, and everyone's trying to figure out what is the format for this new content. Like, the devices are all going to be out there, but what kind of content are we going to be doing? Um, there are people that are getting in that place right now and, and learning about that, and there's people that are going to just not be present until it is already a major thing. So, goals. As a PM, I want to challenge the existing plan and create better outcomes. Kinda, kinda means that I don't really believe in what's on the roadmap. You might need to tell people that, it's, and that can be harsh. Um, focus on impact by tripling down on specific <coughs> initiatives. So there might be something that's going really well, like the data is showing, like our users are loving this. We want to see more of this. How do we make this just happen even better? And some of that may be just like, guys, we need to throw gasoline on the fire, and then we'll have something really interesting happen. Try not to piss off too many people by calling the baby ugly. When you have a CEO that is very attached to a founder, and it's like, this is their baby. Like, this is what they work for. They have a very specific understanding of that. And maybe that works really well for them. And maybe that's a fantastic you know, company that's growing. And then maybe it stumbles. Maybe that vision needs help. And maybe they hired you specifically to help them with that. Uh, and so you need to be able to approach that situation. Like, I hear what you're asking. I understand your goals. How about we say this in a different way? How about we refocus this? How about we take your real emotion and feeling and put that in the direction that can really uh, be achievable? Uh, defend your ideas honestly. Uh, judge the likelihood of success and impact. So if you are full of BS and you're arbitrarily picking things and you're just like, I want to be the one that's taking up all this space, you may be able to convince people that that's the right thing to do. And at the end of it, it's going to not be such a great scene. Uh, so you need to be honest about your um, understanding of your product initiative. Okay, if we do this, what's the risk? What's the impact? What outcomes are we really looking to have? Um, and all through the way, you're going to be getting feedback on this. Like When you go through, when you start socializing this idea, when you start seeding it, you'll be getting feedback, and you need to internalize that. And then filling a vacuum. There are product organizations that hit turmoil and a lot of people leave and then there's a big gap. Um, that is an opportunity, you know, like it's real opportunity for a lot of product people. If there's not a jam-packed roadmap, if there's not a great vision, then you can start listening to the user. You can see what's there, what is accessible, what can we do quickly, what can we prototype and get out there, what can we ship that would be like impactful for that company. Um, all right, so the rest goes on for a bunch of steps. 
you got to refine your vision. Um, when you have a big idea, it's probably not that good the first time around. Um, it might be fantastic, it might be a fantastic shower thought, uh, but you need to be <laughs> suspicious of it. I mean, the best ideas are like always shower thoughts, like it <laughs> like comes down to it. And um, you, uh, like, so you need to refine that. How you do that is you need to start bouncing it off people that you trust within the organization. This is before anything else has happened. You need to start um, challenging the existing way of thinking. So our company does this. We've shipped widgets. This is what we do here. Why would you try to do something different than this? Or we are focused on this, this kind of business, this kind of opportunity. You need to be able to challenge that. I worked for a CD and DVD manufacturing company. It's like one of my first full-time jobs, like during peak MP3 download time. So like everyone, all the independent musicians are moving over to like Bandcamp and all these different platforms for being on Bandcamp to exist system. But all these different platforms for <coughs> distributing their music and their business was just eroding. So like, you can look at all kinds of different ways that you can support those users, um, but it, the business isn't going to stay the same. It almost never does. They ended up going back into shipping vinyl, though, which worked well for them. Um, uh, stay within the core strengths. So if you're an e-commerce business, it's going to be really difficult to do something drastically different. If you are an ad tech company, it's going to be really difficult to do something drastically different. What your company is good at, what your team is good at, you should know that and you should stick with that. You will have better outcomes if you stay within that wheelhouse. And it's super disruptive to try to build those skills that you don't have on the fly when you have this big plan. You know, if you want to go out and recruit a bunch of engineers and like front end engineers that know Angular and Backbone and like, you know, they're, if it's fresh to you, it, it adds a lot of friction there. So the North Star of a company, um, it's a real vision. Sometimes that's part of what the CEO or the founder has given, um, and sometimes that wears out. And if you're coming to the roadmap conversation of, I don't think we should be working on this, anymore. this this stuff that you guys have outlined for the next 12 months is not going to do you any justice. I think we, we could head down this path. Um, you need to have a personal North Star to build your narrative around, even if it's not like, you know, Tesla being like, we're going to disrupt petroleum uh, uh, transportation. Even if it's not, you know, SpaceX, like we're going to make, you know, colonization of Mars happen. You, you personally need that to describe your narrative and to make that work for everyone that you communicate to. Um, and be an expert. If you're going to do this, you need to know it better than anyone else. You are going to be the major resource. People are going to come to you and you're building trust and credibility. Right? Take that seriously. Um, seeding your vision. If you're the CEO or you're the founder and you've got the check, it's really easy to be like, I want to work on this. I think it's fantastic. Everyone agrees with me. And people are like, okay. And then if you are a product manager, um, you are basically asking for an investment. Depending on how big your company is and how big this feature or how big this change is, you're asking for multi-million dollar investment to work on this project. Treat it as such. Um, you need to influence a lot of people to get that funding. And the best way to do it is to have other people pick up that rally and cry for you. Um, in every company, there are people that are um, highly trusted. You know them. The people that everyone, they're like rock solid. Like, you know, that person, like she knows it, she's a straight shooter, everyone goes to her. Uh, they're on like hiring committees, they're part of like every major decision. Those are the people that you need to start having lunch with and start seeding your ideas. Um, to fight bias, like everyone thinks that they're doing a fantastic job. Sometimes it's good to see doubt, like, you know, I don't know about this. Like mobile is really changing the game and about, uh, you know, desktop, how people buy in e-commerce. You know, millennials are shopping in a different way. Like if you see doubt in a certain way, then you can ask those what if questions. Like what if we were to work on a project that tried to encompass these goals and these kinds of outcomes? Um, by seeding that, you, people will be more open to being like, oh, it's interesting. You know, there, there can be a lot of group thinking organizations, especially at good times when you're making lots of money, to think like we're aces, like everything we do is golden. We shouldn't be too concerned about the future. And then some of it's call it as it is. Um, you do need to call the baby ugly sometimes. You do need 
you need to tell people, like, that's not the best idea for your users. That's not the best idea for our company. You know, this could be a distraction for us. Or we might not succeed at this. Um, so as you start seeding these things with people that I trust uh, and the other influencers, you know the people that are like gregarious, they've got you know, people's ear, work it out with them and talk to them, seed your idea. Um, it's a lot better than you just standing on a soapbox and preaching at people, which is often what happens. This entire presentation came out of a conversation with, uh, with like kind of a junior PM that had an awesome idea. It was fantastic. They like skunk works did with their engineers, built this whole thing, made a, like a, like a uh, kind of awkward prototype front end of this big thing that, that they thought people were going to pick up and use and it was going to be the future of the company. Just no one listened to it. Like, it's really awkward to have that happen. It burns your engineers. It burns your time and your effort at your company. And that's not, it shouldn't always be like that. People should recognize the effort that you put in. They should be able to recognize the effort. But with all the noise that every company has, all the different product teams, all of your different stakeholders, all the different like competitors in the marketplace, sometimes it's difficult to like stop and pay attention to these magic moments that people create. So if you approach it in a different way, you may have better outcomes. Um, these are some of the things that, uh, that I worked on. Um, so, Reduce risk and remove blockers. Before you even have a commitment, before you know that this thing's gonna work out, before you've talked to the CEO and sold him on your fantastic, him or her on your fantastic vision, um, there are going to be hidden blockers and hidden gatekeepers. Find them way ahead of time and remove them. If this was going to fail, how might it? Um, what can be removed? You know, I'm, I might be over making this overly complicated. And how will I measure my success? And how will that fail for me? These are all things that need to be decided like way, way ahead of time. I worked on a project. Um, it was a fundamental infrastructure change for a major SaaS platform. And I thought it was going to be fantastic. Like, this is the best thing. It's going to make everyone more money. Like, all the modeling and the revenue was like, this is going to be fantastic. There was one gatekeeper in the data team that, like, if I did not talk to him, like, six months ahead of trying to work on this thing, it never would have shipped in any period of time. And every company has some little piece like that. Um, it could be marketing, it could be some data team, it could be someone, you know, something is going to trip you up. Your ability to find those things ahead of time will really help you out. Um, this last piece, how, do I, how will I measure my success and how will that fail me? That whole um, MAU, like, I want to have more users use my app like every month. It's kind of an arbitrary metric. A lot of these metrics that we use in companies are just not really based around things that you can cost revenue and increase MAUs. You can get more revenue and totally burn out most of your goodwill from your users. There's a lot of balances and trade-offs for that, and it's something worth considering. Pitch it. So all right, you've got a good idea. You've refined it. Uh, you've seen where this could fail on you. Um, you've seeded it with the influencers. You need to start talking about it with everybody. You need to talk about it with the engineers. You need to talk about it with operations. You need to talk about it with sales. You need to get in front of every single person that you possibly can to see this idea. If you haven't done this at this step, the next step where people are actually slotting it into the roadmap like, still won't work. There is a tipping point in every company's conversations about do we choose to work on a thing? And a lot of that comes from just the spirit of the company and the culture. Your ability to influence that is critical. So this is just legwork. Like talk to people about it, evangelize. Someone mentioned something about like missionaries, like go preach the good word of like what you want to work on. And it, like I worked remotely for a huge part of my career. Fly to the office that has everyone important in it and like go take people out to lunch and knock on their doors and like, try to be able to convince them um, that this is going to be amazing. Also, if you can find a sponsor, someone that really believes in it, that's higher up, that can help you out and remove blockers as well. A lot of this comes back to funding and money in bigger companies and in smaller companies, it's a lot more risk. 
All right, product ideation sessions. So you've seeded it, you've talked to everyone, I wanna do this thing, it's gonna be amazing. We looked at the data, the users want it, the competitive analysis says that this is the right time, the right place to work on this specific feature. And there's another bunch of product managers that are all doing the exact same thing. And so now you've got like just so many engineers and then you've got tons of ideas. You may have a very um, like, you know, uh, hierarchical deciding matrix where like CEO says we do these five things or you may work a little bit more in consensus. If your product team is really trying to measure the impact, the benefit of the different things to work on, um, you may end up in a situation where there's a lot of competing uh, issues in software. So product ideation, how many people have done product ideation sessions? All right. how, who likes them? <laughs> All right, who, who really doesn't find value in them? Who just isn't sure about it? I guess everyone else isn't sure about it. <laughs> so like, product ideation sessions, depends on who's in the room, right? If it's your executive team, not a fan. Uh, if it's your product team, and some of your data scientists, and a couple of your lead engineers, and like the UX person, and you talk about, here's what we're feeling about our product, here's what we feel about the environment, Here's what we've been thinking about and all the shower thoughts I've had over the last year. And everyone writes the shower thoughts on the wall and they're like, oh my God, you had that thought too? That's amazing. And like five people had the same shower thought and hadn't been talking to each other. And they're like, dude, that's probably high impact. It looks pretty low effort. Um, we can prototype something and get something magical out. And having the engineers in the room, and having user experience, and someone being able to mock on it, you can have some really amazing things that happen like that. Uh, so it, it can be fantastic. If you are going to seed your idea up in one of those situations where you have an offsite, product offsite, everyone's coming together, your ability to have this happen is, is big, usually a democracy. So if you've seeded and socialized your idea well through all those other steps, You've, um, you've got the data to back that this is a good idea. You can kind of quantify what, uh, what you want to happen with it. And then you are in the product ideation session. You should be able to at least have a fair shake at having your, uh, your project get worked on. Um, but it, it is a game of chance, because depending on who your decider is, they might just be like, that sounds fantastic, but we're still going with this idea. Um, but I, this has worked out for me a couple times, uh, and it's been great. But it depends on how you do your, your footwork. Um, I like product ideation sessions. I don't mind it. Sell it. So, all right, say that you actually get to work on it. This is the MVP. Uh, and, get a viable MVP. Can't say the word. Um, <laughs> this is this phase. You need to understand what you're actually selling. You need to know how you're going to sell it. You need to know how you're going to price it. You need to know why people are going to care. Um, Please prototype it. Please get in front of actual customers. Please get in front of actual users. Please do that yourself. Uh, no one else is really going to ship this software for you. You're still on the hook for it. So it's important that you sell it. You need to go sell it to the sales team. You need to go sell it to the uh, internally. You need to go sell it to your major partners and be on the hook for that. Each time you do it, you will get information back, and that's very, very critical to, um, to creating a really great product and having a strong release. You need to know who it works for and who it doesn't work for. Uh, and it might be fine that you know, you've only got this small population focus on like 10% of your users that you think are really going to adopt this, because you can always figure out how does that scale over the subsequent iteration. Uh, user experience feedback um, in interviews, client councils to validate, these are all great tools uh, depending on how you use them. Some people don't like some, but I like them. Uh, be bold but safe. So, Again, your product managers. You're getting paid to make fantastic outcomes in software companies. Software by nature is high velocity. You need amazing things to happen. You need to either create value, uh, you need to create revenue, or you need to disrupt something else, like eat someone else's lunch. Um, you need to be bold with that, unleash your thinking, but you need to be safe. Um, if you are trading your revenue or your stake in what's core to your business that you have uh, for something that you really want, you've got to be careful of how much ground uh, or how much run out you're willing to. So in rock climbing and mountaineering, if you're going to climb up a certain part, 
you put in an anchor. You put like a, you know, uh, like an anchor in the wall, you attach a carabiner, and then you start climbing above that. Every so often, you need to do that again. So you can fall twice the distance of how high you climb. Make sure you think about that or feel that when you're doing product. How far am I willing to risk where my core is, what my safety is, what my real revenue is coming from, and what my users expect from me? If you abuse your users and you're saying, we're not this kind of company anymore, we're gonna charge you twice as much, we're only gonna do uh, features X, Y, and Z, and what they really needed you for was this other stuff, you can abuse your users, totally abandon your core, and lose a ton of your revenue, even if you thought it was a fantastic idea. It might even be a better product, but the users you have today are not the users you have in the future, and if you abandon that ground, it's very difficult to get it back in there. Um, and the go-to-market is yours. Um, Every product I've ever worked on, be the owner. You have to be. I've had amazing product marketing teams. I've had amazing sales teams. I've had just amazing experiences all around. Uh, but at the end of the day, if this was your idea and this is your baby, like, do whatever it takes. Like, you make it happen. Um, ship it. So I think a lot of today has been talking about shipping it. How do you implement it? Um, how do you work with your engineering teams? How do you make sure it's the right product? How do you iterate uh, through the discovery process and make sure that, yeah, this is gonna work. We should, we should really get this out there. Um, if you don't ship it, it doesn't exist. I, like, that may sound really obvious or painful, but the um, emotional need to have your vision, like just be out there in some form, to have users react into it, to just, for it to be out there is imperative. For you to maintain the goodwill of your engineering teams, your sales teams, everyone else that you just said, hold on, I know you want this feature, but I'm gonna work on this. Like all of those uh, like ambitions are just waiting on you. You need to be able to show something. Um, if you do not ship in some amount of time, people will become unrestful. So, it's really important that you try to do something in a manageable fashion. So reduction of scope, think about what is the right thing, how do you iterate on that in time, what's gonna be the most impactful, um, and how can you really know that you've got a hit on your hands? Um, yeah, do whatever it takes. Um, pick your success, success metrics, but be honest about your impact. Um, you can do a lot of things in the hopes of revenue, you can do a lot of things in the hopes of users, you can do a lot of things in the hopes of efficiency, just like making things easier on your team. Um, it's very easy uh, when you get caught up in this to overextend what you think the outcomes are gonna be or, you know, salespeople will come in all the time, a business development person, any company, not a specific one, um, and they'll be like, hey, I've got this opportunity. If you build fe feature X, it's worth $5 million a year. And they're just gonna do that every day, $5 million. And then you build that feature when is it ever $5 million? It's rarely $5 million. Every once in a while, it's $100 million. But that's <laughs> really in the minority. And so, um, but like you as a, as a product person are going to end up being in the same boat, where you're gonna be asked to somehow quantify, like what is the value of this? Like if we go after this market, we go after these users, we build this thing. If you, if you have this investment of millions of dollars of like engineering time and resources and like marketing dollars to build this thing, what is the outcome gonna be? Um, how you measure that, you should be honest with yourself about that. And you should be honest with everyone else. Uh, the revenue thing will just come back to burn you because you might not know what the revenue is going to be. You might be like, this is going to be an incremental lift to everyone that uses it today, and they're going to be so happy with us. Like, we're going to be differential, we're going to be competitive, but we might not actually make any more money, maybe just like a smidge in the first year. And that's an okay thing to say. You don't need to say like, we're gonna be like up $100 million, but you, sh you should be honest with that. It's part of product is having integrity, having credibility, is truth to power of those things. Rest. So this entire process is like a burden. You know, product can be a burden. You are taking the hopes and dreams of a bunch of different people. Uh, you are taking competitive analysis, you are measuring the data and the users that you have, you are working with engineers, you are burning the midnight oil to try to get the right outcomes to happen with your engineering team, and it's a personal drain. How, all right, well, let's, how about it this way? Has anyone not felt personal drain? They're like, actually, it's pretty, pretty easy for me. Like, anyone feel like it's pretty easy? Okay, once in a while it is. 
and I feel so good for you, that's amazing. Um, but like a lot of times, like this, this whole thing can be a major burden. And so you need to make sure that you, um, like when you're training for a major activity, like you have rest cycles. You train for marathon, you have your long run, you have your sprints, and then you have rest days. Make sure that you do that. You taper down before your next big push, because after you shift, you have to figure out how to actually make this thing what it needs to be. Because your first iteration is never good enough. It never hits with the right audience. And all of these assumptions that you made uh, are going to come to light. Like, we built this for this, for user X. And then we found that user B was like all about it, but they were misusing the products like 100%. But like, use case B, like someone else is like using this in a completely different way, that's fantastic. For someone to care about what you did is a really strong signal, even if it wasn't the intent of your product. Um, but that's often what happens when you release something. So being able to identify those, find the highest engaged users, um, figure out what they're doing, look at the data, like, how are they using it, why does it work for them, and how might you bring that to the other group of users? How can you replicate their success? Um, and don't let the iteration stop. Uh, a lot of organizations are guilty of like, the roadmap syndrome. Like This thing says it stops in Q3, and you're done, right? All the engineers are released. The, the like funding is released, like you get to go, and then everyone, everything in Q4 is being worked on these other opportunities. Uh, you need to be really clear about what stages of these different releases are. Um, if you're working in a continuous discovery and release fashion, where we release something, we learn about it, we look at the users, we release a little bit more, we, we factor, uh, these, like, this initiative goes on for like quite a while, and you need to be sure that you can maintain that. Um, the roadmap will lie to a lot of people. If you let the roadmap lie to people, it's going to be on you. They're just going to yank your funding, they're going to yank your engineers, and they're going to be off to the next project, and then you're going to be left with what feels like a broken project. Uh, and, you know, one more time. Um, all right, discussion topics. So I babbled at you of a lot of personal opinion, and it's all very subjective. And uh, so you're free to like call total bullshit on that. Um, <laughs> and like, I don't mind, uh, you know, because that's the way it can go. But so some discussion topics we can talk about, like, you know, how do I deal with these things? Like, I have a really fantastic idea for my company. I, I think we should really do this. We've got all the right parts, all the right experience. If we just do this, it'll be like a fantastic outcome. Um, you have like different kinds of CEOs and founders. Some of them are like, we're going to do AI this year. It's like, we have no business working on AI. Like, why are you bringing that up? And, like, and then some are you know, down to like editing the CSS on a button, on the buy button, because they're like, no, it needs to be this right shade. Like, and, and, and then some of them are super hands off. They're like, I don't know, man. Like, you guys, I trust you. I trust you to do what's amazing. I hired you to do a fantastic job. Uh, so make it work. Come back to me with solutions. When you need something, you come back to me and I will make that happen. And there's a lot of different kinds of people. So, I don't know, here's some discussion topics. Has anyone feel any of these things? Has anyone run into these situations? And like, has anyone had any of these struggles that they want to talk about? Um, actually, want to be on top of the, um, what comes next after you ship it and you see that the user actually use it. I mean, in, in some, better, like, lucky, more, more fortunate case, you actually have a success. And all the teams will be really enjoying the result. But then how can you keep the dynamic going when everybody thinks that this is, this is it, this is the peak? How can you keep it like going up? Yeah. So a lot of that depends on the structure of your product organization um, and what outcomes uh, that you really want. So the OKRs are like, we want you to increase like frequency, we want you to increase revenue. You only solve these problems, go figure out how to do it. If you're focused on that, you might try a bunch of different tactics. Those tactics might be, we built this feature, let's see if it works. Maybe it worked a little, it didn't work that much. You're kind of free to kind of work on other features that might do that or augment or iterate on that. Um, and then some of these things are mediocre successes. And that, those are the hardest ones, where it's like, this thing kind of works, right? Like, we did this, this thing, and it sort of works. Some people are using it. Sort of makes money. Am I going to maintain this for like five years? Do we just leave it here? What is the next version of that? Um, a lot of that comes from how you are measuring the success. Uh, so if you 
if you are like OKR based and you really want to see um, like the frequency of the users, I want rabid users. I want like uh, like Pokemon Go. Like I want people on this for like 33 minutes average, like a day, and just like grinding on it. How do you make something addictive? How do you make it like uh, have those feedback loops and, and rewards for those uh, those users? You can think about those things and then you can try different different parts. I think the biggest problem is when you just like we're gonna do this. It's gonna have this outcome. We ship it. And it sort of achieves that. Then it's like, okay. We we'll just move on to the next thing. Um, I don't always think that's a bad thing though, because sometimes that feature may just be a feature and it's just, you know, it just does a certain thing. Um, yeah, maybe, I guess, um, it's in, but it's important to communicate about the outcome, uh, like up front. Like, what do we want the outcome to be? Does anyone else have a different take on that? Question on something else? Yeah. You had a bullet point earlier about success metrics. Yeah. You have examples of when that's gone very well. I think we'll have examples of when it hasn't. Yeah. I'm going through that right now. Sales says amazing. You have something maybe more specific about how you can actually apply something trackable there that you can evaluate six months later, twelve right, months right. later. Yeah. I mean, some some things are really easy. Some things are really hard. So, like, I worked in ad tech. Uh, some of the features I worked on were about making app developers more money. Uh, and so they've got an app, they show ads on their app, and every ad request that comes in asks for an ad for that user, and then they fill it, and then they make a little thing. Um, the, some of the things that we worked on were um, ways in which we can increase competition in that ecosystem to make sure the highest value ad always came back to them. And so we were like, all right, we are going to pay them less on average, but we're going to fill so much more. So they will make more revenue throughout the month. Revenue is a really easy metric to make. You explain like, oh, your eCPM is going to go down, but your fill rate is going to go up, and whole revenue is going to be this much more, and the ad quality will be better. As long as you understand like how you're differentiating between these different things, then you can communicate to that user, and you can have good outcomes. Uh, more difficult things often are around users. So if you're uh, designing a consumer-facing application, you know, like, I want people to use this four times a day. You can like ping them with push notifications and spam them like crazy, or create a bunch of like little interactions that they need to do, but they don't gain utility or value. And so you might have boosted, I mean, I guess this is negative, not like positive, but the positive is the inverse of that. It's like, I want the holistic lifetime value of this user to increase. I want to have like the install rates on my app to be like consistent. I want them to find real utility out of my application and keep it on there. Whether they use it every month or not, like, oh, I just install it because when I need it, it's there. Like you might not always need a flashlight app, but when it's there, it provides a fantastic utility. Um, so I, I think um, a lot of those extend back to the user value and the utility of the user experience that you're creating on how you're going to measure the success on that. Um, so I think some of those are around populations. So like if you're looking for a specific slice of your users to like um, do something different, and you're creating a feature to make them do something different, if you can measure that up front and it's like, boom, hit it, and it like didn't have negative repercussions anywhere else, that also feels fantastic. Um, so we've done that sometimes. I think the, the CEO founder is always a really interesting one. I deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I have a, a technical founder who basically wants to get into the yeah. so, I usually approach that by framing options. So it's like, sure, we want to move that 20 pixels to the left. Absolutely. Or we could be talking to the board to be able to see and leverage um, you know, additional resources for hiring. We could be dealing with vision, be, be on BD calls, all those things. So yeah. that doesn't necessarily just have to live with that C-suite level, but I think it's just about giving people options to which the next time they think about that, yeah. then they're, then that kind of seed is planted. Like, oh, maybe I shouldn't. Right. So, yeah. Some, some, of, it, it's, it's some of it's like trust. It's yeah, like exactly. sometimes like, this is my baby. I've got everything riding on this. Like I need to be careful about everything that you do. And as they begin to trust the teams more, hopefully they back off that. Absolutely. In situations that they don't, you might find that they don't actually know how to do the CEO founder job. They're like avoiding it, and they're like focusing is like I know what you guys do. Like yeah. let me come in and party in the product room. I see. And, um, and so it is helpful to remind them, like, this is what I expect from you. Like, 
I, my bosses work for me. Like, I need you to do this. I need you to remove blockers. I need you to keep us focused on the right things and to talk about the right outcomes. Like, if you, uh, if I'm working at a startup and it's like you want to get acquired in the next like 12 months by one of these kinds of companies, if you frame that to me, I can think about how we might build real value that would be attractive to those companies. We're like, we're, we're doing IPO. We are building massive value. We're doing a revenue play. Optimize the shit out of this. Like we can, we can frame that. Um, but I need you as a boss to be able to uh, to help. You know, what are the real outcomes that you want to have based on the guy? Other questions? I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. I just had a I just had a baby. <laughs> You're my friends now. So I just had a baby. Um, I didn't have it. My wife had it. But um, yeah, so she's like uh, nine, days, nine days old today. And then still all last night. Um, so yeah, I'm really happy. Wait till she's two. Right. She's like walking and like tea girl stuff. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so I'm tired as well. Right. I really appreciate you guys. Hopefully I added some kind of value. Um, yeah. I have a question on. When I came, I had more of like hijacking the roadmap because a lot of times the engineering teams, based on the previous instance of the roadmap, that's what they have in their mind. So if you're coming up with a new XYZ feature, they are still operating on the existing roadmap, and now you just brought a new baby yeah. into the mix, yeah. right? Super and then they're like, it's not my baby, that's your baby. Right, right. That's your ugly baby. Yeah. <laughs> so how, how do you hijack the yeah, yeah. roadmap yeah. to make them like your baby and right. accept your baby as their baby? <laughs> so, so, all right, so when I went to work at Smato, I can talk about Smato because I don't work there. Um, when I went to work at Smato, it was like a 10-year-old startup based out of Hamburg, Germany. Um, they started in mobile ads before there were mobile ads. They were doing stuff on feature phones, like you know, iPhone wasn't out yet. Way ahead of their time. They found their path over like a lot of years, but a lot of the infrastructure they had was dated. You know? And so like, they hired me to come in and to help them. Uh, so when I came in, I found a lot of things that I wanted to kick over and, and like an augment. And, and, I, and I was, you know, they had a roadmap. They had things that they wanted to work on. They had commitments to partners. They had salespeople selling things. They had user growth and revenue that was like based on certain assumptions. And they had an entire existing product team with their own roadmaps and obligations and things that they were working on. Really difficult to come in and just be like, I know you want to work on this, but just stop for a year. And I did that, and they stopped for a year. And in six months, we had shipped the first version of their new ad server, completely re-architecting how their ad exchange would work, and we got to turn it on. And some things you can like get in front of users and, and test an MVP, and some things you test in production, and that thing was tested in production. We set the thing live, and people were seeing 60% more revenue and 80% more fill rates on the ads that they were getting. And it was like a thing that was like a lot of faith. And then, so that was the first part. We, we cut everything, removed as much complexity as possible to be able to do that. But the only reason we got there is I, I pitched it to everybody. I went to every engineer and convinced them that this was the future. I, I see the doubt in what they had built before. And they're like, we already built this. It works fine. We're making money. Why would you, like, why would you spend all this money like, refactoring stuff we had? It's like, this is not optimal. I can show you the map. This thing, you use data to help build that argument. But in ways in which that you can say, the users want this, the ecosystem is doing this, your competitors are doing this, you need to be in this space right now, and you can be very timely. Um, I pitched it, I battled it, I convinced everybody. But being able to do that, like, it takes a lot of effort, but seriously, people in operations, people in sales, people in QA, like, you need to convince them and socialize it across the board. Do brown bag sessions. Like if you're coming in with as a subject matter expert on a new thing that like that company isn't used to doing, like host lunch and learns. You know, like this is what I did. Like this is all this amazing stuff. It's important that you knowledge share, and that's how you build credibility enough for people to take the risk with you. 
every company is looking for leadership, the product leadership. And sometimes that's coming from your CEO founder, and sometimes that's coming from the product team. They're like, this is the person that knows about this. Like, my friend Samin knows everything about like, you know, uh, like ticketing, and how to buy for events, and like just got hired at Siri. And isn't that fantastic? What Siri might be able to do in six months? But like, she is the subject matter expert of that, and like that that would be amazing. Um, so yeah, so. It's disruptive. You can't force it down their throats. The best way to do it is to socialize it. If you find the people that are most influential, convince them first. If you find the people that are most trusted, you know, those real solid engineers in the engineering department that people are like, yeah, that person knows what's up. Convince them first, and then it becomes easier. Any questions? Yeah, here. Yeah. I was just going to make a comment. Because um, I watched the whole presentation kind of have the same reaction of like, OK, how do you uh, actualize this? Um, and your personal story is actually more compelling. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but what I just heard you say was was really the um, the need to have credibility in your organization to be able to do any of this. Because I've been in organizations where it's very top down, and if you tried to do that, you would have been fired. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You would have been challenging the. Yeah. The organization. Um, so I feel like that to me is the key point, right? Like you need to build credibility with lots right. of people. You absolutely do. So you being an expert, you knowing your stuff about this opportunity, you being able to describe it and convince the right people to build the credibility with them. Um, that doesn't happen overnight. The best idea, like that engineer that I talked to, his idea was great. It was a great thing. And they skunk worked it, they made something that everyone should have been really interested in, but his credibility wasn't there for what it could, could have been. Um, also, the narrative wasn't quite right. So some of it is, as you build credibility, part of that is refining your narrative about, if we do this, it could be a ter terrific outcome for us. But how do we think about ourselves as a company? And if we put effort into these initiatives, how might that work out better for the future? Yeah, I agree with that. I was going to offer some, I, I do a lot of change as well in my organization. I was just going to offer that, um, in my in my case, there's a lot of listening. You, know, you listen to the CEO or the stakeholder is, and when you understand their objectives, you fight the objectives, not the features. Right. Because you fight the features, you're going to lose every time. Right. right. And so you have to understand their, uh, their objectives, get into their objectives, understand their objectives better than they do. Right. And then offer the solutions that tackle those. That way, the change doesn't seem as dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's still... Depends on your yeah, it depends on, the, yeah, yeah. it depends on how much Some you're changing. Of, yeah. But yeah, absolutely. All right. I think we're almost out of time. Any other questions or anything anyone else's experience that they find? Has anyone else like totally taken over before? You know? Has anyone else done this? You did it before? Was it would you recommend it again? <laughs> right now. Oh you are? Yeah. <laughs> uh, second time. But yeah, I mean I'd recommend it. I mean you gotta fight for what you believe. Yes. You know, you have a slide up there of what do you do with a good product with no traction? And is that a good product? I mean, it's all about getting use and accessibility. Yeah, you have to do that. Yeah. So, yeah, for me, products, um, like, I want to work on really interesting things with really interesting people that have great outcomes. I'm willing to push really hard to have that happen. And if I don't believe in something, if I don't believe it's in your best interest, I'm willing to push on that. And I, and I think that's part of the job. Like, you should be willing to do that. And so if you have a really great vision for what could happen with your company, why not try? Um, the worst thing that happens is you burn yourself out and it totally flames out. Or you make a fantastic mistake. But even fantastic mistakes, if you were safe enough in how you implemented it, you learn a lot. You just learn so much. All right, I won't keep you any longer. Uh, so I'll be around. Um,